Our next speaker is uh, Marjorie Innocent. Uh, Dr. Marjorie Innocent is the Vice President of Programs of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. She leads the strategic development, implementation, and evaluation of the initiatives in the area of health, education, economic development, and leadership education. She holds a, a doctorate in health policy and management from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and French Literature from Columbia University. She, ser she currently serves on the Health Equity Leadership Commission of the Black Caucus, Brain Trust, the Planning Committee of the Annual National Conference on Health Disparities, led by the Medical University of South Carolina and uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation National Advisory Council. She's the daughter of Haitian immigrants and is fluent in both French and Haitian Creole. There you are. It's all here. How are you? Good. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, th <laughs> this, this is what happens when you don't submit your materials on time. So, uh, Ms. Rubinger, I very much appreciate the introduction. I have to admit there's a, a mild modification <laughs> that I have to add. As you'll notice in your materials, I'm actually now with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, which I actually joined last Wednesday. So literally <laughs> one weekend. <laughs> um, that said, however, a lot of the focus of my work has actually not changed. And if anything, I'm actually now able, I think, to go in deeper um, around a lot of the public health issues that I was looking at uh, in my prior capacity and looking at the interface, if you will, of practice and policy. And um, in terms of uh, this particular issue, it's actually very interesting that there was an invitation that came my way as I was leaving the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And um, I told the Academy that I would love to participate, however I'm going to be transitioning. And they said, you know what, actually, even better. <laughs> so what I had to figure out, of course, is since I was literally just starting, is how I was going to work this all out. And um, I'm very grateful to um, Cornell Brooks and uh, Peter Williams, who is my direct supervisor at the NAACP for the opportunity to be able to be here with you all today, literally one weekend. <laughs> um, so when I got the invitation, it, on, you know, but wearing you know, sort of one hat and then getting ready to transition, my immediate thought was, hmm, that's interesting. Now, from a strategic standpoint, I could understand why they would want to reach out. From a practical standpoint, not quite as much, because there hasn't been, um, quite frankly, a lot of direct support for the issue of uh, breastfeeding and the benefits of breastfeeding within either organization, at least not to, to my knowledge. Certainly, within the Congressional Black Caucus, there actually has been a lot of support, particularly through uh, now former representative Donna Christensen, who, of course, you know is uh, a medical provider and um, was a big advocate for the issue. And there are a number of other you know, members throughout Congress, quite frankly, who have been supportive of it. But from a, um, I would say, a, a policy issue and a programmatic issue within either organization, it hasn't been, um, if you will, an explicit um, area that really has been focused on. That said, I realized there could be some real benefits to, to my being here. And um, I had the pleasure of speaking with Ms. Rubinger. And uh, we realized that we're on the same page. And so that's why I'm here. I'm very, very grateful to be here. I just have a, a few comments that I want to share with you all. Um, as I always say, I recognize that I'm it, right, between the end of, of, of today uh, and the reception. But in terms of um, talking about this issue from the perspective of um, the African American population in particular, also thinking about other communities of color within the United States and their um, social and um, economic realities, if you will, of these communities. I think it's a, actually a very, very important and very timely issue for us to be looking at this and for, you know, for us to be talking about the uh, concerns, if you will, and opportunities uh, to be able to expand the conversation around breastfeeding within um, uh, the populations that I've talked about and explicitly through these organizations, including the NAACP. So um, obviously, as our nation is focusing more and more on um, health and wellness and also on prevention, the opportune time is really here uh, for us to continue to raise awareness, as I've said, um, here but also uh, abroad. 
And of course, you've heard today about you know the the, the benefits of breastfeeding. I'm not going to go through them. Obviously, you're all much more familiar uh, with them than even I am. But just by way of context, and just you know, sort of giving you a little bit of background. So at the NAACP, the mission um, of the organization is to ensure the political, educational, social. Um, and economic equality of rights for all persons and to eliminate race-based discrimination. And one of the focal areas of the organization's work is in fact around public health. And the, the focus of public health actually reaches um, a variety of well-documented areas that are really uh, pre critical for uh, some of the existing racial disparities that we see in this country, including chronic disease and HIV. And so toward this end, the NAACP has um, a number of initiatives currently in place uh, through which it really helps to raise awareness around how to prevent these conditions, both through policy and through practice. Um, and some of these obviously include uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, as well as obesity and HIV um, among African Americans and other populations of color who are disproportionately affected. That said, the NAACP certainly also recognizes that in addition to um, individual level behavior, if you will, but that also access to uh, care as well as health care coverage are also critical components um, and are essential for disease prevention and management and certainly for health promotion. So while the organization advocates for um, access and coverage through all of its programs, it also has a very specific initiative that actually is earmarked towards helping to um, enroll people within the Affordable Care Act as well as informing them about some of the benefits, some of the most, most critical benefits of the, uh, of the law. Now, um, while these efforts have not explicitly focused on prevention, as I just mentioned, they are linked, in fact, by a common thread, and that's this emphasis on health promotion and disease prevention. And so uh, moving forward, I can say that um, I am certainly new in my capacity, but I will work with my colleagues to see how we can more intentionally integrate messaging around uh, breastfeeding and benefits of breastfeeding within the work that we're doing. I can't say definitively that there will be um, an initiative that will focus exclusively on it, but quite frankly, from a strategic standpoint, I think integrating um, you know, the benefits of breastfeeding and the issue of breastfeeding within a broader prevention-focused mission uh, or focused messaging is actually way more effective um, and you know, um, separates it out less, if you will, as a, as a, as a, as a distinct issue, um, especially within greater efforts to promote prevention, including better nutrition for, for younger kids. We've heard a lot uh, earlier today about you know, some of the challenges around nutrition that young kids are, are facing when they're outside of school, but the reality is what we also see is that before a lot of these kids even reach school, there are a lot of deficiencies within their nutrition, and obviously breastfeeding can be very um, integral in addressing those. At the same time, we also have to further um, efforts to identify and to address current challenges to increasing breastfeeding among African Americans. Some of these certainly are rooted in um, limited exposure at the family and community levels, and we've already heard about some of those today. At the same time, they can also lie within the healthcare system um, or even within workplace culture. So for example, how well are black mothers um, educated about breastfeeding irrespective of their level of education or income? To what extent are they receiving culturally competent and comprehensive um, and respectful support around breastfeeding? Do most black moms with newborns or infants work in an environment that accepts or supports black, uh, breastfeeding? And I can say based on personal experience um, in some of my prior places of employment, the concept of supporting moms who were breastfeeding was there. The practicalities of actually doing that, <laughs> that were not quite as there. And so um, there were some moms who did in fact advocate for better um, space availability, literally, to be able to do so. And they were able to make that happen. Now these are organizations that obviously are, are smaller. Um, and the reality is in terms of, um, you know, sort of putting your, your efforts, if you will, you know, where, um, where your, your, your policies are is actually something that's very, very critical. In some other organizations, it may not be something, or companies for that matter, it may not be something that's as feasible. Some of the challenges are also economic in nature, and those are the ones that certainly are uh, even more difficult to address, but also just as critical to address. So for low-income women, how long can they actually afford to be on maternity leave? Um, is nursing during the workday feasible? For a lot of them, literally, it is not an option. 
Um, is there enough financial support available for expressing and for storing milk? So through the Affordable Care Act, uh, most health plans must provide breast pumps, as we've heard today, um, as well as counseling for pregnant and nursing women. Um, however, the type of pump and whether the pump is new or rented can actually vary depending on the type of health plan that women have. Some very, very good news, there is now a tax provision that allows women to claim uh, lactation supplies as a medical deduction on their taxes. That's the good part. Um, the cost of these supplies, however, must exceed 10% of their adjusted gross income, 10%. Uh, now, this threshold, though, here's what's interesting. This threshold is actually more achievable for women who can actually afford to breast for a longer period of time, like a year or more, um, along with the costs, right, the increasingly rising costs over time, of course, of pediatrician visits, lactation workshops, and other supplies, all right? So again, there, there, there are, there's a benefit that actually is there, but it isn't one that can actually benefit the, the very people who may, we may want them to benefit the most. Uh, Medicaid, of course, as you know, does uh, provide coverage of lactation services for up to three months. The law, the, the language in the law is a little interesting, of course, uh, but in fact, it does amount to, in essence, you know, a little less than three months, up to uh, a little less than three months. But this coverage, of course, is based on state preferences, so it isn't necessarily um, a benefit that is um, uniform, if you will, across federal law, but in fact, how it, in, it gets implemented can vary by state. And of course, in some states, you, you can already imagine what that means. So not all states reimburse for lactation services separately, okay, um, as pregnancy-related services. Also, there's a lot of variation in the coverage that they offer for lactation services as part of prenatal, postpartum, um, and infant care. And of course, experts and advocates such as you continue to push, as we were just talking about, for suitable space and break time uh, for women who are breastfeeding and returning to work to be able to express and store their milk. Um, while there is a provision in the Affordable Care Act that actually covers break time for pumping, um, there are limitations regarding employer size, okay, so a lot of smaller um, organizations can actually be exempt from, um, from this uh, requirement, if you will, um, and also uncompensated time. So women can actually get the time to do this, but whether or not they'll actually be paid, all right, um, is up for grabs. It really completely depends on the employer, and of course, for certain types of employment situations, it's probably something that's not going to happen. So then it, it's a benefit, again, with some real you know, economic strings attached that could wind up, in the end, continuing to create a real impediment to breastfeeding short and long term for um, a lot of women. It seems, um, in closing, I just want to say it seems particularly ironic um, and unfortunate that both norms and cost can be a hindrance to breastfeeding among African Americans who are particularly susceptible to its benefits. Um, advocates, providers, employers, researchers, policymakers, and others really need to do a much more effective job of collaborating to help to overcome some of these barriers for the benefit of all babies and moms, and I dare say for the benefit of everyone in our country. Thank you for your time. Hi. Excuse me. I think, Jana, you said something about three major countries, China, India, Nigeria, accounting for more than half or just about half the number of babies that were not put uh, skin to skin after birth. Maybe I'm remembering that wrongly, but you did say something about those three countries. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Why is it that that is the case in those countries? Or is it just that they are the most populous? I didn't quite get that. I think uh, it's a combination answer. I think part of it is that they're the most populous, so the numbers are highest. So of course, if you're designing programs where you want to have an impact and save the most number of lives possible with your dollar or your euro or whatever it may be, um, you're going to go where you can have the biggest impact in a focused area. I think there are uh, specific barriers in those countries that are different for each country. In China, there's a very, very high rate of C-sections now, approaching 100%. Um, with the one-child policy, everybody wants a perfect baby, right? And the best way to ensure the baby's perfect is a C-section. Um, so that becomes a tremendous barrier to breastfeeding. 
Um, in India, there are a lot of um, beliefs around breastfeeding that impede that early initiation. Colostrum is considered dirty. Um, Mother-in-laws um, perpetuate that myth, and so um, you get this very sort of deep intergenerational interaction um, that, that works against breastfeeding. In Nigeria, um, that's a little bit more of a puzzle uh, because I think in general, and this is a gross generalization, so caveat up front, um, breastfeeding is more a part of the cultural norms in African countries than it is in Asian countries. In Nigeria, the rates of exclusive breastfeeding are actually quite low. I'm not sure I have the statistic in my head. I think it's around 30%. Um, and I think part of that is due to the, the trauma and the mobility of the populations in those countries, as well as some other factors which we probably just don't understand very well yet. Thanks. Well, that, that's an interesting comment about uh, cesarean sections, because I presume they're semi-planned, mm -hmm. so that mothers mm -hmm. have not had 48 hours of labor, right? a C-section and then expected to breastfeed, but other mothers who've had 48 hours of labor are expected to breastfeed if they delivered vaginally. <laughs> so that there's something wrong with the system. C-section <laughs> should not be an excuse for not breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Hi, Casey Rosen, Carol Rochester. Um, I have a question for a lot of the people in this room who work internationally, and that is um, the development of so many amazing materials and programming. And the question that we get a lot, and I just got another call this week at the Lactation Study Center at Rochester for refugees who need materials in the United States, and kind of where to go to find some of these. Um, and I confess, as some of the people were speaking, I was looking up some of the programming, and, and it's sort of hard to pull up from online a lot of um, the materials in other languages or with culturally sensitive and appropriate messaging. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone here could speak to that um, for people who are in the United States dealing with refugee populations from a lot of the places that you're studying and developing materials for already. I'm not sure there is much, um, unfortunately. And, and I think it may be one of those situations where we start borrowing from what we do in international contexts and bringing some of those materials into the United States. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think we do a great job with knowledge management. Um, but I think, for example, I know all the Alive and Thrive materials are on their website, aliveandthrive.org, and it has all of the mass media, all of the council, everything is up there. So it. it Depending on, I think also because unfortunately some of this is quite project driven, if it's a real objective for the documentation, they do a better job. And so as I look across our big portfolio of programming, it's something that we're constantly kind of struggling with, to your point. So at this stage, I would say it's probably making those individual contacts and us looking around because a lot of this is the great, you know, the stuff that we have on our computers. So I think you're right, that's a real problem. And it's a problem, you know, just within agencies too to know what one arm did and the other. You know, I'm sure we're all plagued by that, and then it kind of manifests up. So I would say, you know, if there's a particular population that you're interested in, there's probably, you know, the, the nutrition community isn't that big internationally that, you know, you connect with one of us. This is a stopgap measure, and then we can kind of try to figure out who might have some resources for you. But that's just a Band-Aid, I think, for a bigger issue that you've noted. I think that's a good landscape research project for a fellow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's a good point, actually. So if I understand the question correctly, you're talking about refugees who are in the United States. So I mean, one immediate thought that comes to mind, and I, I hardly think it's any kind of perfect solution, but um, they're, they're likely to get care through community health centers, I'm thinking, depending on where they are, of course, throughout the country. Community health centers could actually wind up being a good model for sharing materials. Um, and now, of course, the question becomes, you know, do they have the resource, human resources, literally, to be able to um, implement and to sustain, you know, any kind of effort, but it could be one outlet, you know, sort of a, a centralized healthcare outlet through which, you know, something perhaps yeah. could be tried. Our stuff has been used, the Vietnamese community in California, mm -hmm. we had as a partner UC Davis who has a lot of links with um, K. Dewey in particular, has been a big proponent for a really long time, and actually all of our stuff has been brought into different community clinics in California. Okay. So I think there are those sorts mm -hmm. of examples, but not done nearly enough. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. 
Hi, I'm Kim Moore with United Methodist Health Ministry Fund from Kansas, and um, I hope this isn't too sophomoric, but I was interested, Think I didn't see anybody talk about maternal depression mm. as playing a role in this breastfeeding rate, and I think I'm right that there's pretty good research that breastfeeding reduces maternal depression, but I wonder nobody's seeing this as a causative factor in why breastfeeding doesn't continue I just wondered uh, if you could respond to that that's a great it's a great observation and you're absolutely right and all the baselines that were um, that were basically yeah they were nationally representative baselines in three countries Ethiopia Bangladesh and Vietnam maternal depression was a predictor both of chronic malnutrition and suboptimal breastfeeding practices um, and there's actually a paper out on those three um, so internationally I think it's begun to get known I think what I've seen which is interesting is then groups including our own will say well we don't really know what to do about that and so then I think there's almost this like desire to not address it you know because the response but actually I think there's a lot that we are doing that maybe is not kind of tagged as this is addressing maternal depression but things I worked a lot I actually started my career in Pakistan with Save the Children and the idea of getting mothers together to be able to share their experiences was profound and just anecdotally I felt like the women that had more malnourished children and were having more issues were severely depressed frankly and so the opportunities to get women to share to get some support I'm convinced if we actually looked at that care Hopefully we would see that borne out in the data that that is an effective intervention. So I think you're, you're absolutely right and more attention needs to be paid to it. I would just add in another piece to that. It, it's more of the effect rather than the um, cause piece that you were discussing about maternal depression. But I know there are also pretty good studies that have been done on infant massage and the link to postpart decreasing postpartum depression. And this comes back to that um, kind of circular model that I had on one of my slides where I had KMC breastfeeding and milk banks and how they become mutually reinforcing. So I think massage is actually another piece of that. Um, and even, I found this actually quite interesting, in one of the studies that I looked at, women whose babies were massaged by somebody else had lower rates of postpartum depression. And of course, women who massaged the baby themselves had even lower rates. So it's, it's one, of those, um, one of those things that I think deserves a lot deeper exploration. So um, I'm Allison Stubbe from UNC. I was just going to comment. Um, we have an ongoing study at UNC looking at the role of oxytocin physiology in postpartum depression and maternal sensitivity. And I think the concept of, you know, we talk a lot about breast milk as this amazing substance that is really important for babies, but the connection between the mom and the baby and whether that connection is positive and whether mom can respond to baby's cues and all of that becomes critically important. Um, and I think there, um, Dr. Raju made the comment early on that in med school we learn about the components of breast milk, we don't learn about the actual act of breastfeeding. Um, and so I think that um, it's really important to address maternal mental health, to address birth trauma, to address trauma history, certainly in populations that have been moving around a lot. There are all of these issues that are going to make the warm, fuzzy feeling you're supposed to get with breastfeeding potentially not so warm and fuzzy. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's also really important when we think about measures to think about measuring mom's experience of breastfeeding. Because if we can get to 90% exclusive breastfeeding for six months, but moms are hating it, yeah. mm -hmm. and they're like, Ugh, yeah. I don't know that we've won. Yeah. Um, and so I think, obviously, we want that breast milk in the baby, but we also want the mom to not hate the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and we need to figure out how to quantify that. One of the things. Or, or, I mean, there's, and there's the whole exclusive pumping phenomenon, which is another area. One of the things that I think has been um, kind of disturbing a little bit in the nutrition world when we've been focusing on the thousand days is that that focus is on the child almost exclusively and the breastfeeding is about the child and that is hugely important but you're absolutely right the mother is that <laughs> other part you know and so the whole the focus on you know the the um the conference, for example, in, in Mexico, the maternal kind of newborn health conference, trying to get nutrition more into those. So it's it's great, <laughs> you know, to have Jana here, for example, because even within organizations like SAVE, I don't often see the maternal side kind of come in as much as it needs to. So the focus, you know, to your point, I think, I think people are getting that, um, but it's not as well developed as it should be. And it's, again, you know, kind of like rationalized around the child uh, much more than the, the mother, and it needs, you one of the things that we talked about in one of our 
earlier conferences, we had two presentations. Um, one was the Founders Lecture one year from Marshall Klaus talking about the importance of attachment. And all of that research clearly is focusing on the mother and the baby. And the other piece is um, the research that's been po published in our journal and at our conference, um, the research um, by um, Eleanor Bimler-Schwartz talking about all of the effects for the mother. And all of our ACOG members at ABM um, are very good at reminding us that it takes two people to breastfeed. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'll be one of those other women who um, say that. So I'm Susan bodner Darren. I'm from Virginia Commonwealth University. And I did um, my postdoctoral work at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And we actually did an intervention that looked at um, the goal, the aims of the intervention were to reduce um, postpartum depression and increase breastfeeding duration. And what was really cool is actually the same intervention did both. Um, and especially the increasing um, duration, you know, the intervention was given 24 to 48 hours after um, birth, so a lot of the moms had started, and we had really high um, initiation rates, but we increased breastfeeding duration um, for uh, all subgroups in our population. So it was kind of cool. Um, and so we did a lot of work around postpartum depression and and breastfeeding and uh, child feeding practices in general. And we really kind of found that depression interventions are breastfeeding interventions because we found that um, in terms of newborn baby safety practices, um, exclusivity of breastfeeding decreased with, our, with depressed moms, um, but so did the early introduction of water and solid food. So um, it is, I just kind of wanted to reiterate that we really need to be looking at this stuff holistically, because it's a dyadic relationship between mom and baby. So, so there are things out there. You bet. Don't want to say anything, but I want you to say something about what's going on in Puerto Rico. No. Because you and your dad started a project many years ago. Well, I'll have time tomorrow to talk about it. Either you use this mic or that mic. <laughs> 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 I'm glad to, to be able to be here. And Dr. Lawrence was with us when we, when we inaugurated a NICU. And that was when my youngest was, that was 25 years ago. I met Dr. Lawrence, and she's been my inspiration. And it's very fascinating to hear all about what you're doing in Africa and Puerto Rico. We're so close to, we're part of the United States, and we have this terrible you know, situation in terms of economics right now and breastfeeding could really be improved. But when we talk about the Hispanics and the Latino, and there's so much about matriarchism and familism and things that are involved in that postnatal care that, and the prenatal care, so much prenatal orientation that we need, and we need to include all the family members. And uh, mostly the mothers, you talked so much about mother-in-laws, but I think in the Latino community it's the, more the maternal side mm -hmm. rather than the mother-in-law. Uh, the father is important because he feels macho and he wants to provide, and the, the grocery shopping is between everybody, and that's very important when you have a mother who's breastfeeding and somebody wants to do the grocery shopping because it's not formula that what they have to buy, and we really have to stress on that. So I'm getting besides the point, but it's just a different topic. We'll talk about it tomorrow, and um, you know, I'm really. And when you talked about maternal depression, we see it, the attachment is so important, and the and the skin to skin is something that we really have to to emphasize, and that's what we've been doing in Puerto Rico because. With the baby friendly, not having the ingredients that we had to have that contact on the first hour, and not having rooming in really, really defeated all the purpose of, of having exclusive breastfeeding. But we're working on that. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy? Yes. You put on the spot. Go ahead. Seriously. the equator and a little bit further west. Um, are things different in North Carolina? In what respect? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think many of the problems are the same throughout the world. I think many of the problems are the same throughout the world. I think every country has its own special cultural differences that um, make breastfeeding either a bit easier or a bit harder. 
Um, certainly we see a lot of postpartum depression um, like many other countries. I think um, early skin to skin and early breastfeeding is fairly normal um, in the hospitals, but it doesn't mean that we have necessarily really good breastfeeding duration figures. We have 96% of women initiating breastfeeding, but you know, like most other countries, it plummets fairly soon afterwards for a whole lot of different reasons. Um, but otherwise, we're still breastfeeding women. Yeah. It's the same throughout the world. Yeah. Can, can I just make a follow-up comment on that? Um, recently, I went to visit Sweden to see their NICU and how they practice skin-to-skin and -skin KMC, and looking at that as a model potentially for other areas in the world. And of course, they are leading the pack in many ways in terms of how early they start, how small of babies they're doing this in, um, creating units where there's a, a large bed for the family to be in in the NICU where the mother and the father can sleep there with the baby. And I was struck because um, the, the person who, the neonatologist who was giving me the tour said, well, yes, we have this great program. We've worked really hard to keep it, but I've, we just aren't having great success anymore with um, C-section babies. And I said, why is that? He said, because of funding cuts. We only have one midwife per shift, and we don't have the human resources to come and accompany the baby from the delivery room or the operating room to the NICU, and so we don't have anybody to, to, super, you know, to staff this. And I thought, wow. You know, this, you're, you're supposed to be showing us the way, and with more resources um, in many ways than anywhere in the world, and yet that's the same thing I hear from, from nurse midwives in India. So it really, there's, there's so many of the same issues, I think, wherever you are is just a different twist and a different flavor and a different magnitude. <laughs> At the risk of a little self-advertising, uh, for those who are interested in the issue of depression and breastfeeding, the, uh, the next issue of Breastfeeding Medicine will have a clinical protocol on the treatment of depression and breastfeeding mm -hmm. and the appropriate use of drugs and that. So I welcome that should be published, I guess, come out the July issue of Breastfeeding Medicine. Two, I just got an email, so I, this really is self-advertising, but very much related. Um, good afternoon. It's addressed to my colleague, Dr. Ruth Feldman, and myself. Your recent article, Maternal Preterm Skin-to-Skin Contact Enhances Child Physiologic Organization and Cognitive Control Across the First 10 Years of Life. We did a 10-year follow-up on our co uh, cognitive functioning of the preterm infants in a controlled study uh, with skin-to-skin, -skin, and we were able to demonstrate that there was lasting cognitive improvement 10 years later has made the list of the most highly cited 2014 original articles in biological psychiatry. Uh, <laughs> but I think the issue is that we're talking about not just survival, mm -hmm. which obviously mm -hmm. is, we're talking about 10 year follow up, mm -hmm. still be able to demonstrate differences in cognitive function. I think you all know who I am. You might be sick of me by now. Um, one of the things I'm wondering about that might be different about the United States compared with a lot of other places, and I'd be interested, again, to hear the international perspective, is the level of disparity that we have. Um, that if you really are of a certain class and a certain race, that you're going to get a very, very different level of care and have much greater likelihood of success. I would imagine that that happens a lot in other countries as well, but I was wondering if anybody could speak to what disparity looks like in the United States compared with other countries in terms of breastfeeding support. Go ahead. <laughs> I talk forever on this one. <laughs> I'll let you. Um, it's a good question. I, I, it's completely, again, dependent on the context. Um, in a place like Vietnam, I mean, you're always going to, yes, the poorer, the more disadvantaged, the worse across the board, end of the story. Um, and we just went through this exercise because our new strategic plan is actually focusing on the most disadvantaged. And I said, you know what? That doesn't play out the same way for nutrition because when you have a population that's 40 or 50% stunted, a lot of your population is actually at risk, um, either of you know stunting or is currently 
stunted. Or if you're looking at exclusive breastfeeding, if 17% of Vietnamese women, oftentimes in the higher income quintile, you know, again, it's not, the, the risk is different. It may not be defined by a socioeconomic, so it really depends what you're looking at. Same with Ethiopia. If you look at chronic malnutrition, you actually see a quarter or more of the, of the richest quintile being stunted. So you have to be really careful, I think, in terms of what outcome are you looking at, but by and large, of course, you know, the kind of social determinants are the social determinants. Um, but I think it really varies tremendously in terms of, you know, kind of what you're looking at. Um, I don't know what you would say in terms of care for... Well, the, the one thing I would just say is that um, I think um, access to care and quality of care um, it mirrors what happens to breastfeeding specifically. I think it happens generally. And if you look, for example, an, a, a sister issue, if you will, of prematurity rates, when you look at the southeastern United States among the African-American population and see prematurity rates of 18%, I mean, that's shameful. I mean, that rivals some of the highest rates in, in Africa, in Malawi, for example, right? So, so, that's, so we have a lot of work to do on disparities, both here and abroad. And abroad, it's no different. It's still divided largely along economic lines. Um, and so I don't have any magic answers for that. I think we know some of the things we need to do to work on that. Um, but it's it's definitely a, a global problem. Did you have a comment for Did you have a comment? No, I, actually I don't. I, I think the um, the statistic that you just mentioned obviously raises. <laughs> I mean to say that it you know it 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 raises flags um, and the need for a very very different model of healthcare and understanding of of prevention and communication around health is an understatement and obviously. If we see those kinds of rates, um, it, 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 it explains a lot. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and so, uh, once again, in terms of looking at how, <clears throat> excuse me, we really need to reform our healthcare system and the realities of how not just policies, you know, ultimately get shaped and passed, but the, how they really get implemented. That's really the whole story, mm -hmm. and especially how they get implemented um, in. A country such as ours where, you know, for better or worse, there's a lot of, there are a lot of rights, if you will, around states, <laughs> right, and how states can choose to shape um, healthcare systems based on the needs of their communities, but also based on a variety of other factors, which, you know, we're not going to get into <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, and even in the face of evidence that suggests that a different model is in, you know, is, is necessary, it doesn't always happen. Um, so once again, in terms of really um, thinking, I think very strategically across different sectors, um, and you know, really doing a, a, a more effective job, I think once again, um, of understanding the the problems one, but then the commonalities across different problems, and then coming up with some real solutions, and ultimately really working to affect political will. Because let's be clear, a lot of it ultimately is really about that. It's it, I mean, this that's just a gl another glaring example right there. And I would just say this might get me kicked out of the nutrition club and be slightly provocative, but when people ask me what to do on nutrition, long term I say invest in girls' education. I mean that, it, you know, you need the short term stuff and that's what we're, you know, absolutely, but that's what's really going to move this and, you know, that's where you see these disparities play out. So that's probably more my personal opinion than institutional, but... <laughs> <laughs> Our institutions will come along. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to answer also the question about um, disparities. I think in very general terms, what we see is that when it comes to breastfeeding indicators, actually the poor in most you know, developed, uh, underdeveloped countries are actually uh, doing better Very than better off. Strategy. So it is totally, yeah, yeah. totally <laughs> different from any other indicator. Of course, the reasons and the pathways are different. I mean, people, you know, higher income uh, groups want to, you know, aspire to a certain models, certain practices. So, um, and they or they and or they deliver in in private, mm. sorry, private facilities where the healthcare support might not be as good. So it is a different reason why there are different disparities. Um, it's also striking that in some countries the 
um, when women deliver in a health facility, which is something that we want, that we promote, but then the rate of early initiation might be lower than the women who right. deliver at home. So sometimes right. the reasons are different. So in maybe in those facilities, there's not enough support for breastfeeding and at home there is that support. So some things are yeah, counterintuitive, but they have yeah. um, their own reasons. And also when it comes to, to C-sections, we know it is a big problem, I think, in, in many countries uh, to achieve breastfeeding. But for example, Brazil, which has very high issues with um, high C-section rates, but they ha they do very well on um, breastfeeding. And yeah. unfortunately, they haven't done studies recently, but so we have to believe what they say and based on on, on uh, smaller studies, but they do very well. And it, that is because they are committed. And actually in Brazil, in the 10 steps, they have included um, something on reducing C-section. So they're actually combining um, breastfeeding support and C-sections. But just to say, so there are different reasons why there are disparities and yeah, we need to look at that. And I was going to address the disparities question in the U.S. a little bit. Um, so as you all know, there are many disparities in breastfeeding rates in the U.S. There are socioeconomic disparities, geographic disparities, racial disparities, maternal education. And so when we, so as at CDC, when we're trying to better narrow and achieve more equity, um, we look at some of the practices. So one surveillance system we have that looks at hospital practice, mm -hmm. the, it's the Maternity Practices in Infant Nutrition and Care, the MPENC survey, because it is a census of all birthing facil facilities. And so there we do see poorer maternity practices in uh, hospitals that are located in communities that are more predominantly African American. And so in our funding, when we put out funding to assist hospitals to move towards baby friendly, we are able to, um, we're able to put, pr give priority to hospitals located in those communities um, that are more predominantly African American, also more predominantly low income communities. Um, also, we've used that same surveillance system to look at the rural-urban differences because we have lower breastfeeding rates. I think it's more than 10 percentage points lower. Um, it's not as it's not as uh, it's not as much a disparity as we see racial uh, the racial disparity, but we do rural-urban. And when you look at those hospitals in rural areas, you see lower score quality scores on maternity practices. Um, it varies by practice, though. On the rural-urban, you see actually better practice in terms of keeping mothers and babies together when you look at those practices um, on rooming in and um, other care. Uh, but you see a very wide disparity on staff training. Right. Um, and so that's really, again, trying to help us understand even when we work in those hospitals, maybe rural hospitals need more innovative approaches for training of staff, but they're doing a great job with keeping mothers and babies together during the hospital stay. Um, and then, uh, you know, we've heard over the uh, in some of uh, when we brought when we brought in experts to help us with um, addressing racial disparities that one of the issues is the lack of funding at the community level, and so we had a pilot a few years ago. Um, where we provide funding directly. We often work through state health departments, but in this pilot, uh, the funding went directly to community-based organizations to do a variety of innovative programs on what they what, you know, they make the decisions in the community on what is most appropriate, whether it's training of staff, baby cafes, um, a session at Walgreens where a pharmacist or lactation consultants, but it's all about increased access to support at the community level. And now, um, the, actually, that pilot is, uh, it's going to be in a supplement and Journal of Human Lactation in November will be published. Um, uh, you know, most of most of those articles coming from the communities, and now they're that same type of uh, process is used in funding where we work with NACHO, the um, National Association of City and County Health Officials, and the funding goes again directly. Now we're in 63 community-based organizations. We don't have much funding, but we use every penny that we get. Um, um, it was only like I think we had just under three million dollars, but it could go all back out through those communities. But it's just trying to find ways to better address disparities, because we do see a difference in that access to support and the um, hospital practices. So. Thank you so much for, for that information. That's um, very heartening to, to hear. And one thing that, well, you know, what you talked about made me think of that I, I, I don't think I, I said necessarily is that we have to recognize also when we, we talk about uh, sort of cultural appropriateness, if you will, of efforts, 
that we also need to be careful of not making blanket assumptions around defining the groups that we're talking about, right? So, if, you know, you can look at African Americans even within the Southeast. I mean, just the South, just the Southeast of the United States, and we can make assumptions around, oh, you know, the, you know, those folks, you know, down there, they're all, that could wind up, <laughs> that could wind up backfiring on us big time. And so, I think that there are certain. Um, there's some baseline information, if you will, that evidence has shown it will certainly help to support um, breastfeeding overall, right? You know, the, the, the entire process, if you will, of, 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 breast, of breastfeeding, um, even starting before birth. But in terms of understanding what is best for particular communities, that's going to require a lot more work. Um, and the reality is, is that, you know, the reality, I think, is that in terms of um, putting in the appropriate efforts, if you will, to go ahead and make those determinations and see what really works, in some cases for different individuals, but even within you know, um, communities, there could be some, some real variations and some real lessons, that, quite frankly, at the same time, you know, that, can, that can be learned. I think we need to be sure we keep that in mind as well. Yeah. Uh, I thank you for all your three presentations, but the conversation uh, around maternal depression, postpartum, uh, when I first joined Kaiser in 79 and 80 and 81, we were trying to actually get our hands around one part of depression and breastfeeding at that very beginning time in which we saw a huge transition of the Latino population from Central America and Southern Mexico migrating in the first of three generations of migration coming up to the lower states and in which the cultural difference between community support, uh, grandmothers, aunts, et cetera, taking care of the mother while the father or the significant other moved to the United States created two levels of depression, one financial, one migratory, and then a third level, which was the postpartum depression could not be tied differently from those at times. You couldn't separate them. We were trying to look at what are the tools that we had at that time to deal with that. It became very clearly that once any population has separated from its community support and migrated, Nep the, uh, the Nepal uh, 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 example there was that the local area did not come back in to support that mother. For whatever reason in our community of resources and extension in the last 50 years, we've not learned from the, the fundamental basis that the mother's early identification of postpartum depression exists within the nearest closest relative supporting her. And when we and we're trying with the fa Kaiser Family Foundation and all that kind of stuff, trying to put a research model just to be able to know what has to come back into the milieu to identify the depression earlier. All right, especially in the first six weeks postpartum, because most of the time when they get to their first OB visit, then the pediatric visit six weeks have occurred. Yeah. And then the checkpoints for that, and I, and I also looked at third world because I've worked Central America and South America extensively in Mexico. We noticed that any time whoever is the next in charge of that mother in her care, the minute that they move in the migratory pattern to earn more money, the breakdown is complete and then before you lose the contact with it. So just to, as we think about that part, it is a very big part. We've looked at this for 35 years and trying to figure out the best research pattern to identify it. It's very tough because once they migrate and I call it dissolve, it never recreates itself again. However, I, did, I found one community which is the Salvadoranian community. When they migrate, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, in Guatemala, do not do it, in Hondurans do not do it, but the Salvadoranians do. Uh, they send a nucleus of young families, usually three or four brothers and sisters who are married or have a young, you know, young girls, 13, 14, 15. They migrate first and become citizens of whatever country they're going to go to. Within six years, the younger children are brought in and adopted by them and then the grandparents and aunts come and they have a community built in and there's seven or eight of them in a community, for example, in, in five cities in Southern California, then they all migrate to one community, buy homes and work with jobs. And this is repeated over and over and over again. I've been able to watch these, tra uh, my contact with those communities has been very good, but that's the only one that I've seen that has done that. And they have, they have very, the small group of people are really very committed to the success of the other ones. So, you know, it's an interesting observation and uh, I don't think there's an answer for it yet because we, we, at least in the United States, we definitely don't like people to be depressed. <laughs> They walk in your office, and if they're if you don't have the skills to identify that depression, yeah. it's it's by you immediately. So part of that is on us as physicians to also increase our awareness about it. 
deal with that. I think the that. exacerbation not only is that across borders, but within countries. So within what we're seeing with the urbanization in developing countries, yes. the social, to your point, the social networks and social safety nets that you might have had in a rural community are not there. Not and there. that's becoming as the population urbanizes in Nigeria and everywhere. That is just right. going to be a bomb about to go off that we don't know how to deal with. That's right. And that's yeah. why I, my thought is always then the, the brain, I call these, you all are brain trusts, you know, this growing phenomenon of trying to really isolate out how we can best address these things. Because the, the rest of the people in the world aren't thinking of this stuff. You know, they don't think of it at this level. But when they, when we can put our, our processes together, there has to be a, not necessarily a solution set, but a pathway, a strategy that becomes articulated in such a way that the powers that be, the political powers, et cetera, don't necessarily have to buy into, but they have to become part of the solution set. Yep. They, they never want to buy in at the beginning of anything that's <laughs> going to cost money, right? But um, I've always found in my, in my career is that anytime I had a physician who had uh, a daughter or something like that with a breastfeeding problem and depression, I'd said, why don't you send her to me before you send them to the psychiatrist and lose 10 weeks of an appointment, right, to dealing with it. And they were very open to that because they didn't know who else to send them to. And that's sort of the thing I feel about with this kind of subject in research. Why don't we be those people that they start sending us those people to study so that we get the handle on it? Make sense? I would also just give you a word of encouragement when you notice a pattern like that and yep. you've seen it propagated over decades yep. now, um, really being able to dig into that and highlight it and, and use it as a, a model to oh, learn from is so important. I work with models all the time. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Good observation, by the way. <laughs> I think you mentioned educating girls and um, I think boys need to be educated too, but I think Part of the problem is is that the education they get is pretty much non-existent growing up. They don't necessarily get it in a, in a home that mom hasn't breastfed. And I was asked by our local high school to review a health textbook several years ago. So the first place I went was to the index to look up breastfeeding, and it had two references. And the only two references were if you if you breastfeed or if you smoke, you can't breastfeed, and if you have HIV disease, you can't breastfeed. And nothing else was in the, there's a section on childhood nutrition. They talk fruits and vegetables and all that good stuff, but the breastfeeding thing wasn't even mentioned. I wrote the author and got a, probably a, a non-answer back saying that, you know, he's done his job and, you know, it's not, doesn't seem to be that important. Um, I think New York has, uh, has integrated that into their, their curriculum, but I would, I suspect even internationally, there's not much that goes on. So if, if they don't see it in the family, generationally that's going to continue because they're not getting it anywhere it's not educationable it's not educated in schools hi again i'm stephanie from mississippi gulf coast and i just wanted to address someone said something about the importance of staff education and uh, being from mississippi we are the highest infant uh, uh, prematurity we're one of the lowest only second to Louisiana in breastfeeding rates um, we have a population of, of African Amer African Americans that do not breastfeed uh, but I wanted to tell you a little success story we had no money in the hospital where I worked there was no money that we could be spent on educating the staff I felt like it was extremely important that one person cannot take care of all the breastfeeding moms in the hospital so uh, we took that on and we got March of Dimes to pay for food. I said, if we're going to talk about breastfeeding for nine hours, we need to feed these people. So they agreed to do that, built a curriculum, and in four years we went from 1% exclusive, less than 1% exclusive breastfeeding to 72%. Ooh. Just with educating the nurses and we were all speaking the same language. I also wanted to speak, we had for uh, just a, a probably a month and a half I uh, followed our statistics and we have a particular uh, physician who most of the African American women flock to and uh, it was really interesting I saw over about a month month and a half that our rates increased significantly with that population so I went to him and I said I am so proud of you how on earth did you get all of your moms to breastfeed? And I said, usually they'll initiate it, but they won't exclusive. They won't be exclusive by uh, discharge. He said, yep. He said, 
I tell him, because we had just become a, a recipient for donor milk in our NICU, he said, I tell him, if you don't give them your milk, they're going to give you some milk or your baby some milk from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot do that. Wow. I appreciate your efforts, but so I did see a huge shift, but it was because he was telling them. That. So just thank you. I'm going to add one anecdote to that just to reinforce this idea that what comes around come, goes back around. Um, I was visiting a milk bank in South Africa. And I was talking with this uh, woman who was a white South African who'd been a champion for breastfeeding and, and breast milk banks for a long time. And she said, you know, yeah, sometimes we have problems with getting donors to, to donate milk and our supply is down. And she said, but you know, the best thing that ever happened for our supply. And I said, what's that? And she said, well, you know, we have to have a cutoff of a certain gestational age um, when they no longer qualify for donor milk. And so there was a white woman in this public hospital that was mainly, uh, that was mainly black, and uh, she had been getting uh, donor milk. And when we cut her off and said, we're so sorry, but your baby doesn't qualify anymore, she broke into the NICU milk bank in the middle of the night to steal the milk for her baby. <laughs> and when everybody realized that this white woman was out trying to steal the milk <laughs> that was out there in the community, that was out there in the, in the fridge, you know, d donations and, and supplies just shot through the roof. So. <laughs> <laughs> It's all in how you value it. Well, yeah. I think what we'll do is uh, conclude this wonderful discussion. Thank you very much.